Good morning. Thank you all for joining us here in the room and online to talk about uh, the federal state relationship in times of recession. I'm Ann Stauffer. I'm a director here at the Pew Charitable Trusts. We are a nonpartisan public charity that uses the power of knowledge to solve today's challenging problems. We are active around the country and around the globe on issue areas including the environment, health and public safety, and federal and state economic issues. Today's event is hosted by the Fiscal Federalism Initiative, and we do research and analysis on the many, many intersections of federal tax and spending policy. We began this work after the aftermath of the Great Recession and in tandem with looking closely at how to strengthen state fiscal health. So my colleagues and I have been talking about how uh, to help federal and state policymakers navigate an economic downturn. And while it's not a cheery topic, I'm glad that you're all interested in this question as well. Because as we know, it's better to be prepared, particularly because it's, it's hard to predict when a recession will happen. And um, we don't really mean to jinx anything by holding this on Friday the 13th. But we are entering the 124th consecutive month of economic expansion. And those of us who track taxes and spending are really beginning to wonder. So which is why we're happy to have Mark Zandi here to explain current trends and what may be coming over the horizon. One thing we do know, though, is when re recessions happened, it can have profound impact on states. In 2002, which is after the official start of the 2001 recession, state revenues dropped by 4.2% in one year. And in 2008 to 2009, during the Great Recession, state revenues dropped by 10%, which meant that states faced two consecutive years of really tough budget choices. Which is why, for both of those recessions, the federal government provided stimulus funding. In 2003, Congress provided $20 billion. $10 billion of that was for Medicaid uh, funding and 10 billion of that was for the State Temporary Fiscal Relief Fund, which was basically a flexible amount of money for governors to deploy as needed. Then in 2009, the, uh, Congress passed the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, which was most more commonly known as ERA, and what we'll talk about as ERA all day. Um, and that was originally estimated at $787 billion over 10 years. It was a multi-pronged approach. It included tax relief, assistance to individuals, and also uh, what ultimately became $275 billion in assistance to states. Most of the state funding was geared to supporting state budgets, but also included many uh, programs that states had to oversee and administer. The largest uh, direct funding was $99 billion for an increased federal Medicaid share, which for many states is either the number one or number two cost category in their budgets, and often sees increased enrollments during recessions. And then next came 54 billion in the state fiscal stabilization fund that was primarily for education, which is, if not number one, then number two of state budgets. So it, uh, ERA was supporting the two major uh, cost categories in state budgets. And then these were complemented by very specific appropriations to different programs, including transportation, broadband deployment, and renewable energy that states had to oversee and implement. ERA's emphasis was really to get the money out, do it right, and show where the money was going. And this actually uh, means it's easy to forget the enormous implementation effort that this took and that it placed significant demands on federal and state policymakers to solve complex problems and weird, what people might talk, think about as bureaucratic issues quickly so the money could get where it needed to go and could also be reported on. And this is why we're so pleased to have Governors uh, Douglas and Kulingowski with us here to share their experience of leading a state through uh, the Great Recession. And also Ed DeSev, who was led the White House Stimulization Coordination Office. Ray Shapak, who was the uh, head of the National Governors Association at the time. 
and Tom Hansen, who was both uh, Minnesota's budget director and state's stimulus czar at the time. They will share their experiences with the day-to-day -day federal state coordination that was required. There were, there were really many, many people, like hundreds of people who played an important role in making ERA work. And we're really fortunate to have some of the key players with us today to revisit this experience, uh, to better understand the federal state relationship in recessions, to discuss what worked and what didn't, to look at what policies understood or didn't understand about each the other level of government they were dealing with and what that meant for implementation, and hopefully lay the foundation for what I'm calling a federal state playbook in times of recession for policymakers today, most of whom may not have experienced the 2009 effort. And I'm actually curious um, for folks in the room if uh, anyone was in federal or state government or in an era recipient entity uh, during the Great Recession. Okay, some hesitant, some small, but not a, not a lot, not a lot. And that's exactly why we want to have this conversation, because if you haven't lived it, it's very hard to understand how complicated it was and what it took to actually implement. Um, so we're looking forward to a really great discussion. We have, uh, but I want to do first some important housekeeping issues, as always. Um, we have two breaks planned, the first after Mark Zandi's presentation and then after the governor's discussion. For those in, in the room, there are drinks throughout the kitchen and in the back of the room. For those online, we haven't figured out the technology yet to get you coffee on demand. Um, the Wi-Fi password is in your programs. And restrooms are close to where you all came up uh, in the elevators for the men's room is on this side of the bank of elevators and the women's room is on the uh, far side of the bank of elevators. And we really are happy to have you join us in person, online, and also invite you to join us in the Twitterverse using the hashtag recession les lessons, res recession lessons. Um, and then uh, finally, we will be taking questions after all sessions. And uh, we're going to do that by having you write your questions down on the index cards that were provided in your packets. And you can raise them at any time. And one of our uh, team members will come around. They'll be circulating, pick it up, and then give it to um, the moderator to, uh, to ask of the panelists. If you need more cards, you know, raise your hand. We can also provide those. Um, and for folks who are online, please send your questions through the system. So now I'm happy to introduce Mark Zandi, who will look ahead and let us know if a recession seems to be in our future, and if yes, when, and importantly, what kind of recession. Mark is the chief economist of Moody's Analytics. He directs the economic research there. He also founded Economy.com, which was purchased by Moody's in 2005. He has written two books about the Great Recession, but uh, more importantly, he also lived it during uh, 2008, as the stimulus packages were being debated and developed, um, Mark was in the room where it happened, one of my favorite Hamilton songs. Um, he was in the room where it happened, where he was advising the administration and congressional leadership um, and state associations. So with that, Mark, please give us an idea of what we should be planning for. Thank you, Anne, for the kind invitation to be here. Thank you, Pew, for the opportunity. Thanks for the three hours to, to speak. No. Uh, <laughs> nothing worse than an economist for more than, I think I have about 40 minutes, and then we're going to turn it back for any questions or comments that you might have. And uh, my task is to give you a sense of the prospects for recession, uh, near-term recession, uh, over the next 12, uh, 18 months. In fact, I'll, everyone got a pen? Yeah, OK. I'm going to give you the exact day. Uh, so <laughs> you need to write this down. Um, the, the, the talk is broken down into a few parts. Part one is uh, just an assessment of current recession risks. Um, and I would uh, argue that uh, they are considerable. They're high and rising. And we'll go through the, the logic as to why. Uh, part two is, um, you know, most recessions, or all recessions, have a proximate cause. There's generally lots of things going on that uh, are behind the downturn, but uh, you can uh, at least ex post put a f your finger on the, the thing that um, 
as uh, the, the proximate uh, reason for the downturn. Uh, I'll do that. I'll talk about what could take us down. Trade war would be at the top of the list, uh, but we'll talk about that in some detail. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about uh, the uh, part three, the roadmap to recession. So uh, a lot of different indicators you might want to be focused on to try to gauge uh, how things are playing out, you know, whether Zandi's right or wrong, um, get a good sense of that. And then we'll talk about policy, um, monetary policy. That's key to any response to a recession. And because interest rates are already very low, you may know the funds rate, federal funds rate target, that's the interest rate the Federal Reserve controls, is uh, 2% today. Uh, I think next week it'll be one and three quarters percent. So that's not a whole lot of room between that and zero. So that does argue that we do need uh, fiscal policy. If we get into a recession, we'll also need fiscal policy to play a key role in the response. And I'll talk a little bit about that and put it into the context of the experience we had, I guess, 10 years ago now, uh, a little over 10 years ago, uh, with uh, the Recovery Act and other policy responses. Sound OK? OK, good. All right, uh, part one, uh, recession risks. Uh, as I said, they're high and rising. Uh, that gives you a sense, this gives you a sense of it. Uh, this is a, uh, a measure uh, that uh, we've constructed based on a number of financial indicators that tend to lead recessions. So this, is, this shows you the probability of a recession based on data 12 months prior. So it gives you a lead, a one-year lead, by looking at current data. Um, for the geeks in the room, this is just a probit model, zero, one, one recession, zero, non-recession, and uh, relating these financial variables to the, to the zero, one. Uh, the indicators include the shape of the yield curve, a couple measures of the shape of the yield curve. I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail in a few minutes. Um, S&P volatility, that's the volatility in the equity market. Credit spreads, uh, that's looking at the bond market and uh, corporate in, uh, bond interest rates relative to treasury yields. That gives you a pretty good sense of what bond investors are thinking about in terms of uh, recession risks. Um, and just where Fed policy is relative to sort of its equilibrium value, kind of give you a sense of, of uh, the uh, thrust of monetary policy. Um, I'm showing uh, two different measures, uh, what, what I'm calling the uh, uh, unadjusted uh, probability of recession and the adjusted. The adjusted is simply uh, an effort to account for some of the biases that exist in the message sent by the yield curve. And again, I'll come back to this in a few minutes, but there are some uh, well-known uh, differences in the current economic environment compared to past environments that make the yield curve perhaps a little less prescient of a leading indicator, and we've made some adjustments to account for that. But the bottom line is uh, probabilities are pretty high. Uh, if you take the the unadjusted measure, take the yield curve at face value, uh, and the other financial variables. Uh, this says as of uh, a year from now, or a little less than a year from now, the second quarter of 2020, the probability of recession is roughly two-thirds. Uh, if I make an adjustment uh, to account for the biases in the yield curve, it's uh, still high. It's not 50 percent, but it's not, not far away. The other thing you'll quickly notice is that in the shaded bars represent recessions. You, every time this measure goes over 40%, um, we've had a recession, uh, and it's never falsely predicted an economic downturn. And there's a lot of uh, more fundamental reasons to be a little nervous about what's going on out there and why recession risks are high. Uh, if you look globally, a number of major economies are arguably already in recession or pretty close, uh, Germany, uh, Italy, uh, of course, the UK, Brexit is complicating things for them. Uh, Mexico, Brazil, um, Singapore, it's the most open, small, but most open economy on the planet, and it's uh, feeling the ill effects of the trade war, Korea. Um, and here at home, uh, there's increasing signs of uh, recession risk. I, I would argue there are uh, parts, big parts of the economy that are already in recession. Manufacturing would be a good example. The agricultural sector, the farm belt. Uh, is in recession. Uh, and of course, manufacturers and uh, farmers ship a lot of things, so the transportation dist distribution sectors are also uh, arguably in recession. Uh, now, you add up the total output of those industries, and by the way, those, obviously those connect those industries right back to the trade war, right? I mean, those are, those are the industries that are on the front line of the trade war. And um, 
you know, if you add up the output from those industries, it's about 20, 25 percent of GDP. So the economy can continue to move forward if these sectors are in recession, if they're contracting, uh, not gracefully. Uh, it's going to be a bit of a struggle, but it can happen. But if, if the problems in manufacturing and ag and transportation start to bleed out into the rest of the economy, then we've got a problem. That's a recession. And there's some evidence of that, too. Uh, if you take a look at uh, job growth, um, which has been key to the economic expansion, a year ago, uh, just to give you a number to give you context, take the calendar year of 2018, average uh, monthly job growth, non-farm payroll employment growth was about 225,000 per month. So, you know, two and a half million jobs per annum. Uh, if you cut through the sort of volatility in the data, get to the underlying trend in the data, job growth now feels like it's pretty close to 100K per month, about 100K. So that's a pretty substantive uh, slowing in growth. If, if that's the end of it, if we hang around 100K, no big deal. Uh, that's still enough job growth to maintain stable unemployment. Life goes on. It won't feel as great as, it, as good as it has been, but we'll be okay. But if job growth slows any further, then uh, unemployment will start to rise. And we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail in a few minutes as well. But uh, once unemployment starts to rise, game over. Uh, recession is, is very likely. Uh, so part one, recession risks are, in my view, uh, uncomfortably high in, uh, in rising. By the way, I don't, didn't mean to imply too high level of a precision here in the probability. I could take that out to the fourth significant digit. Uh, doesn't mean anything. I mean, so it just kind of gives you a broad sense of, of you know, where, where we are. Uh, I don't mean to imply uh, too high level. The, the recession date I do, that is, uh, you should take that into consideration, the, the exact day. I'll be quite precise. May even give you the time of day. Uh, so, okay. Uh, part two. What, uh, as I said, recessions generally uh, have at their core some cause. Now, this I may be overstating the case here a little bit. I mean, uh, economists always want to find an explanation for things. Uh, you know, my guess is that. Recessions are much more complex than that. There's uh, lots of moving parts, and they all conflate with each other. So it's probably uh, not appropriate to uh, say this is the reason for why a recession occurred. Uh, but we do that anyway. Uh, you know, if, if there is uh, something that uh, out there that feels like it's the proximate cause for that economic downturn. So, for example, if you go back to the Great Recession, the financial crisis 10 years ago, we had lots of problems. Uh, but the proximate cause was the subprime mortgage uh, the problems there. If you go back uh, to the 2000-2001 downturn, that was the technology boom tech bubble. The equity market got overvalued, significantly overvalued, and the correction there uh, resulted in recession, along with 9-11. Uh, I'll go back one more. If you go back to the 1990-1991 recession, uh, that was... Um, Remember savings and loans? Uh, uh, many of you might not remember saving and loan, but they, they were quite a uh, significant part of the financial system back in the, in the day, uh, and they failed uh, miser uh, quite significantly. They got turned upside down on their mortgage portfolios. That was junk corporate bonds. You remember junk corporate, Mike Milken, uh, the approximate cause. I can go back to every recession since World War II, and there's been 10 of them, and I can at least ex post identify, you know, what's what was behind the recession. This risk matrix kind of gives you a sense of uh, the kinds of risks we face and the, and the proximate, uh, the different kinds of potential causes for, for an economic downturn. Um, the x-axis, the horizontal axis, uh, represents the, the potential severity of the event or shock. The y-axis, the vertical axis, is my assessment of the probability of that shock. Uh, how, how likely is it? So just to acclimate yourself to the, to the risk matrix, if you look into the northwest part of the, of the matrix, you can see manufacturing recession. So a high probability event, in fact, I would argue we are in recession, but by itself, it can't push the economy into, the broader economy into recession. So the severity of the shock is relatively low. If you go into the southeast quadrant of the part of the matrix, uh, say, look at the chair, Fed Chair Jay Powell is removed, and as you know, President Trump has been railing against the Fed and ad hominem attacks on Chair Powell and has even threatened to remove him, or at least intimated that. Uh, if that were to happen, that would be 
uh, a big deal. Uh, it would royal financial markets uh, probably cause a recession, would indicate that the Federal Reserve is no longer independent. That would be a big deal, big problem. But you can see I, I put a low probability on that. So we want to focus on the uh, shocks that are in the northeast part of the matrix. And you can see the most obvious uh, is the trade war. Uh, that is a, uh, uh, the, the, a big deal and, at this point, the thing that could push us in. A couple of other things that just point out. I won't go to any detail unless you, you want to, unless you ask. Uh, you can see no deal Brexit also by itself probably wouldn't push the U.S. into recession, but uh, obviously uh, it would be hard to digest, particularly in the current economic environment. And there's a number of other things that we could focus on, but I'm going to focus on the trade war. The trade war, the links between the trade war and the economy are several fold, but there are two key ones. The most obvious is the higher tariffs. Uh, they are a tax on American business and American uh, consumers. Just to give you a sense of the magnitude of the tax, if, if all of the tariffs that the president has threatened to implement are actually implemented, and as you know, uh, we have a lot of tariffs already, but he's threatened to impose additional tariffs on the remaining uh, imports we get from China by December. Uh, if he follows through on all of that, the uh, tax bill, the, the increase in tariffs in 2020, will come in around $100 billion, a little over $100 billion. Uh, just to put that into context, $100 billion is a half a point of GDP, uh, half a percentage point of GDP. The economy is growing about 2%, so half a point is meaningful. It means the economy would be growing below uh, its potential, unemployment would rise. Uh, and uh, it's about half the size of the tax cut that uh, we got last year. The, 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 remember the, the tax cuts that were passed at the end of 2017, implemented in 2018? That's the uh, reduction in corporate rates, uh, cuts for individuals. Uh, that was about $200 billion uh, in tax cuts in, in the calendar year, so about half the magnitude. So uh, th those are significant. Now, most of the tariff increases so far have been on uh, products that businesses use for uh, their own uh, production. It's not directly affecting consumers. It's not like you walk down the aisles of Walmart and you see the effects of the tariff war, the trade war uh, there, at least not yet. But if uh, the, the next tranche of tariffs, the one that are slated to come in December, are actually implemented, that's when consumers will feel it, because that's almost entirely consumer goods. And um, uh, at that point, we, we'd see the higher prices for the things that we buy, uh, many things that we buy. It would be also very hard on uh, retailers. Uh, the, the one part of the economy that's really also struggling, arguably also uh, in recession, uh, uh, but not because of the trade war, is uh, brick and mortar retailing. We're seeing, uh, you know, obviously the online competition really doing a number on brick and mortar retailers, and they are operating on very thin margins if the tariffs are implemented and they can't pass all of that through to to their customers, to you and I as consumers, that, uh, that means they'll be upside down uh, on their profitability, they'll be losing money, they have no cushion, they'll be bankrupt, and we'll see a lot of layoffs in the retail sector. So the next round of tariffs will do a lot, of, a lot more damage than what we've seen so far, particularly uh, most directly to the American uh, consumer. Uh, the second link uh, between uh, the trade war and uh, the, econ uh, uh, the, uh, the economy and, and recession risks uh, is the, the link that I think most economists uh, kind of missed or, or at least didn't appreciate uh, or didn't put it enough weight on uh, up until recently, and that is the impact on business confidence. Uh, business sentiment has been hammered uh, across the globe. Pick your sentiment survey, uh, all saying the same thing. You know, the IFO survey in Germany, the Tankan survey in Japan, uh, we have a survey that we conduct off of one of our websites, economy.com, that we've been doing since 2003. It's a weekly survey. It's a global business survey. Uh, I've uh, to smooth out a little bit of the volatility. This is uh, monthly data, so I've taken the weekly data and made it monthly to smooth it out a little bit. Uh, in our survey, there are nine questions that, that we ask. I'm showing the results for two of those questions, the broad questions. The first one is, around how do you as a business person feel about your uh, business prospects, 
present conditions uh, as of the current point in time. Uh, that's the blue line. And then the green line is a question about expectations. You know, how do you think things will be going in your business and broadly in the economy six months from now? Uh, this is a diffusion index. Uh, both of them are diffusion indices, so it's the percent of positive responses to the survey question, less negative responses. So obviously, if, it's, if, it, if it goes below zero, there's more negative responses than positive responses. Uh, and you can see a, a very sharp erosion in, uh, in sentiment uh, since the, the trade war really got going about a year. We're firmly negative. In the res and I, I'm a little weird. Every Saturday morning I get up, the first thing I do is I look at the survey results. Uh, they're, they're emailed to me from the previous week. And last week, I can't wait till tomorrow morning, but last week, um, uh, last week they fell to the lowest level since the Recovery Act was passed in February of 2009. So businesses are, are nervous. Uh, and it's manifested in uh, already in uh, investment spending. So uh, businesses have uh, become much more cautious in their capital expenditures. Uh, essentially, uh, CapEx has gone flat. Investment spending has gone flat over the past year. And again, this is not just in the United States. This is, this is what's going on across the globe. And in the United States, it's particularly telling because those tax cuts, uh, they were supposed to juice up investment, remember? So a big uh, argument for the tax cut in terms of long-term economic growth was that if you lower the top marginal rate for uh, corporations from 35%, which is where they were before the tax cut, to 21%, which is where they are now, that would lower the cost of capital. You'd see more investment that would raise the size of the capital stock, improve productivity growth, and we get more long-term economic growth. We got, we've got none of that. Uh, there no there was, I was always skeptical of that argument, but uh, you know, there's none of that in the data. Just the opposite. Cap, capital spending has gone uh, completely flat, and, and uh, in part because I think that the tax cut uh, is, is not that important in terms of investment, uh, but also, more importantly, because of the trade war. And now, more recently, and this is where the recession risks start to rise considerably, and I mentioned this earlier, it does feel like businesses are becoming much more cautious in their hiring. They're not, they're not laying off workers. That's not happening. If that were to happen, that, that means recession. We're in recession. But what we are seeing is that businesses in many parts of the economy, many industries, many parts, uh, regions of the country, are now becoming much more cautious in uh, their hiring. And it also makes uh, sense that they would be more cautious on investment before hiring, given how tight the labor market is. I mean, the number one problem going into this was, for business people, was I can't find people. I can't find uh, qualified workers, and I can't retain my existing workers. So there was a lot of churn in the labor market. So business people are very, in this environment, very low to cut back on their human resource activities because they know if they do and they get wrong-footed by the president and the trade war's over and the economy revs right back up, they're going to be caught without the people that they need or lose the people that they you know, uh, rely on. So they uh, decided to pull back on their investment, become more cautious on their investment before they're hiring, and, and that's what we're observing in the marketplace. So um, I, I think recession risks are very high uh, and rising. Business sentiment is very weak. Consumer confidence still okay. Consumers generally still oblivious, again, because they haven't really felt it. Uh, if they do, then uh, obviously you know, recession risks will rise. One quick other point, no deal Brexit. Uh, again, that's a big deal. Uh, it seems like that can's getting kicked down the road. So maybe not, uh, you, the, the deadline was October 31st. Now it looks like it might be January 31st. Uh, something else to watch, uh, another uh, potential proximate cause for recession. Okay. How are you doing? You doing okay? All right. All right. Is this too geeky? No? Okay. All right. Good. Okay. I'll get more geeky. No. I won't do that. Yeah. Uh, part three, uh, the road to recession. So what kinds of things should you be looking at to gauge whether recession actually is, is in train? And um, a few things have already happened uh, that suggest recession. So the best long leading indicator of recession is when the economy uh, starts operating beyond full employment. Now, there's a lot of debate as to what is full employment. Uh, I'd say the loose consensus, CBO, Fed, Zandi, other economists would say a 4.5% unemployment rate would be 
consistent with a full employment economy. That Once we got below four and a half, that's when businesses really started to scream about lack of labor, wage growth started to accelerate in a significant way. We're just for um, a data point, we're at 3.7% on unemployment, so we're past full employment. So if you're past full employment, uh, that means uh, without things like the trade war, the economy would overheat, right? Uh, we would, wage growth would accelerate, inflationary pressures would start to develop, the Federal Reserve would raise interest rates. And by the way, it's hard to remember this, but if you just only go back a year ago, that was the risk, right? That's what we were all concerned about. It was an overheating economy. Then we got the trade war, and that kind of changed the whole kind of narrative and what we were thinking about. Uh, so the economy was on the path to overheating. Interest rates were rising. The Fed was uh, uh, pushing up interest rates. Um, and totalogically, it's just totalogical that it, the unemployment, if you're past full employment, and unemployment is below that threshold, that 4.5% threshold, at, at some point it's got to rise, right? It's got to start coming back. Because if you don't come back, then you overheat, interest rates rise, and you, you're going to have a recession. And by the way, uh, there is always a proximate cause for recession, but a feature of every recession is an overheating economy when, when you have this, this dynamic. Um, so once unemployment starts to rise, even from a very low level, level uh, that is the fodder for recession because uh, when unemployment rises, that is signaling a lot of things going on in the economy that people are starting to feel very uncomfortable about. You and I as individuals and consumers, not just business people, but you, you know, consumers, everyday Americans, there are less uh, open jobs, uh, positions, uh, there are people are getting their, their uh, getting smaller pay increases, they're not getting the bonuses that they were getting. They can sense it. You can feel it in, in, in your everyday life. You can sense it, uh, you can, uh, sense it in, in the labor market. And consumers grow more cautious. Uh, consumer confidence weakens. Uh, they uh, pull back a little bit on their spending. Businesses see that. They start hiring a little less. And you can see how we get into this self-reinforcing negative cycle that, that's called a recession. So uh, uh, the uh, best long-leading indicator of recession is when you go past full employment. And, on average, in the, the 10 recessions since uh, the period in the 10 recessions leading up uh, to the, the 10 recessions since World War II, the average length of time between when the economy goes past full employment and recession is about three years. Uh, we went below 4.5% unemployment, the full employment threshold, in the summer of 2017. So summer of 2018, summer of 2019, summer of 2020. Uh, another very good... A uh, longer leading indicator uh, is uh, weakening profitability, corporate profitability. And believe it or not, corporate profits, economy-wide, uh, have not gone anywhere in the past five years. They've been flat as a pancake. And profit margins, uh, that's uh, the, the margin they get over their costs, uh, have now been declining for almost two years, for almost two years. Labor costs are rising because of the tight labor market. Businesses not, have not been able to pass that through fully in the form of higher prices. Inflation has been relatively low. It's picked up recently a little bit, but it's been relatively low. That means margins have been compressed. They've actually started to decline. And of course, when business people see margins weakening, they become much more cautious and nervous, and things like a trade war really give them a lot of angst and agita. The average length of time between when profit margins start to decline in recession is roughly two years. It's roughly two years. Profit margins have been declining now almost two years. So that's another indi uh, good indicator that uh, we might be on the road to recession. Probably the best, though, most prescient indicator, I mentioned this earlier, is the yield curve. Uh, it is the relationship between long-term interest rates and short-term interest rates. In a normal economy, typical economy, Long-term interest rates, 10-year Treasury yields, are higher than short-term interest rates, three-month Treasury bill. The, the obvious reason is that bond investors, people who buy the bonds, want compensation for the risk of investing in a bond that has a longer maturity, right? Things happen. So, you know, if it's a three-month period, there's a lot less uh, chance that you're going to get uh, nailed by something, uh, inflation or recession or whatever compared to a 10-year period. So you, you demand a, a premium for that. You demand a higher interest rate for that. And generally, the so-called term premium is positive. Uh, and you get upward sloping uh, yield curve. Uh, there are times, 
uh, not typical, uh, very unusual, when the yield curve is inverted, short-term interest rates are higher than long-term rates, and uh, that happens prior to economic downturn. So what this is showing here is the difference between the yield on the 10-year Treasury bond relative to three-month Treasury bills on an equivalent bond yield basis back to 1975, and I'm showing, again, the recessions with the uh, shaded bars. And you'll notice that prior to every recession, the yield curve inverts. Short rates rise above long rates, and it's never falsely predicted. Um, uh, the average length of time between when uh, this happens, when the curve inverts in recession, is one year. Actually, it's, uh, the standard deviation around that's pretty narrow. So, you know, a little bit of give or take around that one year, but it, it's uh, one year is a pretty good, uh, gives you a pretty good sense of timing. The curve inverted by this measure in, uh, in May. Uh, so we've been inverted now May, June, uh, July, August, September. Uh, it's a pretty hard inversion, a long inversion. If history is any guide, that would suggest that the recession would be sometime summer of uh, 2020. Now, the intuition behind this, a uh, couple of di different ways of thinking about it. Uh, the first is uh, the bond market interest rates are a reflection of the collective wisdom of lots of bond investors all over the globe, right? So this is folks that are putting their money on the line. They're putting their money where their mouth is. And they're saying, hey, you know, I think we've got a problem. Interest rates are going to be lower in the future. Uh, therefore, uh, they, they've driven down long rates. So uh, it gives you a sense of what smart people, not that they're always right. Um, clearly, they're not. But, you know, you know uh, the, the wisdom of the crowds are pretty important here. They're thinking about this, and they're putting their money where their mouth is, and they're saying, look, we've got a problem uh, dead ahead. Uh, another kind of intuition behind it is that the yield curve, the shape of the yield curve is very important to the profitability of financial institutions because what most financial institutions, banks, for example, do is they borrow money short term, right, at a generally a low interest rate, and then they go out and lend it at a higher interest rate. So the shape of the yield curve, the difference between long rates and short rates is a very good uh, proxy for the profit margins of financial institutions, their so-called net interest margin. So if the yield curve is positively sloped, they can make money, lots of money, right? I, I have an incentive to go out and make a loan because I'm going to make m more money than it costs me to fund that loan. But when the yield curve is inverted and short rates are higher than long rates, uh, I can't make money. It's like a business who can't, you know, if they sell something and they lose money on it, they're not going to sell it to you. They're not going to produce it. So when the yield curve becomes inverted, uh, net interest margins turn negative financial institutions' profit margins go negative. They stop lending. Too much credit is a problem. That's, you know, f financial crises, you know, if you borrow too much. Not enough credit is also a really big problem, right? Because businesses, consumers, you and I, we need credit to start businesses, hire people, buy homes, buy cars, so we need credit. And if the yield curve is inverted, there's less credit. Uh, and uh, this is particularly a problem after it comes after a period of relatively strong credit growth because you have a lot of businesses or households who've borrowed a lot, and it's not like they're going to repay it. They're going to need more credit. They're going to need to refinance, so they'll come back for more credit. If it's not there, if banks have tightened up and not extending credit, uh, that's the fodder for recession. So uh, an inversion of the curve is, is an issue. Now, there is a lot of debate among economists about the uh, whether the curve – is as predictive now as it has been in the past because a lot of weird things are going on out there. Uh, if you haven't noticed, uh, you know, in Europe, particularly in Japan, we have negative interest rates and uh, the European Central Bank just cut rates, I guess, yesterday again, uh, announced that it's going to engage in more quantitative easing, meaning by going out and buying bonds. So it's driving down long rates. So if you're, in a, say, a German insurance company and you're, gonna, you're looking at a German bond, you know, it's the equivalent of a, a treasury bond, at negative 60 basis points, you go, oh, geez, why would I do that? Why don't I come over here to the United States and buy the U.S. Treasury bond at, you know, whatever it is, one and three, at one and three quarter percent positive is a lot better than negative six. Negative 60 means I'm paying, you know, the Bundesbank or whomever, uh, you know, money, uh, the, the, fed, the German federal government money. That makes like no sense. So uh, this ca these capital flows have depressed long rates here in the U.S. And so maybe the signal is not as strong as it has been historically, and it's overstating the case. Um, maybe, 
uh, I think that's for some uh, validity to that. That's why I adjusted the message in the yield curve in my first chart, if you remember back. I will say a couple things, though, about that. First is um, I've seen a lot of business cycles now, right? I have no hair. I've seen a lot of business cycles. And I see yield curves invert before business cycles. And every single time you have economists, including me, come out and say, this time is different. Uh, and here's five reasons why. Uh, so, um, you know, if I come out and tell you that this time is different and here's five reasons why, you might want to ignore me um, because, uh, you know, the other, the other thing, I'd point out, thing I'd point out is anytime anyone says this time is different, it makes me really nervous. So uh, maybe the curve is overstating the case, but I will say this, it's making a case. You know, it's making a case, maybe not recession, but a much slower growing economy. And if you have a much slower growing economy, you're very vulnerable to, to anything else that can go wrong. So, you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, uh, there's some biases here we should account for. Maybe it's not the strongest signal as it was, but uh, there, there clearly is a signal here. Um, on the road, on the roadmap, so this is a year out. Uh, the next thing to watch is um, consumer confidence itself. Uh, it generally falls only two to three months prior to an economic downturn. It's generally the last, one of the last things to go. You know, consumers uh, kind of oblivious to everything until all of a sudden they go, oh my gosh, and it's a collective loss of faith, and they run for the bunker. And you can see that in uh, different measures of consumer confidence, the University of Michigan survey, the uh, survey done by, uh, uh, by the conference board. Um, so, so far, confidence is holding up pretty well. Uh, it's OK. So it doesn't suggest a recession anytime soon. One thing I will point out, uh, we do watch Google searches. We count up the number of Google searches for the words recession and next recession. And the number of Google searches for the words next recession is as high as it's been since the teeth of the financial crisis in 2009. So there are a lot of nervous people out there Googling next recession. Uh, so feels like they've got their finger on the door to the bunker. Uh, they, haven't, they haven't opened the door yet. But it's like uh, they're, they're reaching out for that bunker door. So you know, if things turn, they're going to turn pretty quickly. And then finally, uh, another very good indicator, um, I know this looks weird, but I'll explain it. Uh, this is the best indicator that you are now in recession. Uh, the, it's a, uh, the change in the unemployment rate. If the unemployment rate rises by more than a quarter percentage point in a three-month period, you're, you're toast, you're done, you're in recession. So I'm, that's what I'm showing you here, a three-month change in the uh, unemployment rate showing every recession back to World War II. A little hard to see, but if you, if you get the chart and look at the underlying data, you can see that, the, that this particular statistic pegs the start of every economic recession since World War II, uh, almost uh, uh, on a monthly basis on the nose, which is a, kind of an effete because uh, as you know, recessions are determined by a group of economists. It's kind of a subjective assessment of you know, uh, when a recession began. But this is a good mechanical uh, uh, measurement, uh, w uh, measured way of, do of trying to peg recessions. You may be thinking to yourself, well, who cares if we're in recession or recession? You know, what's the big deal? You're telling me now we're in recession? I, I will point out that uh, when you're in an economic downturn, we generally don't know it for a long time. We're sitting there debating it for endlessly. Uh, and it goes to the, the quality of the information and data we have. A lot of the economic data is, uh, can't pick up turning points in the economy very well. Take the, take the employment data I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's based on a survey that's benchmarked to actual unemployment, uh, unemployment insurance records once a year. The BLS just recently announced that uh, the upcoming uh, revisions based on this uh, benchmarking to actual employment counts and the unemployment insurance records, which happens in January, will, will knock employment uh, as of March 2019 down by half a million jobs. So it kind of gives you a sense of kind of the squirreliness of the data and the fog of the data. So when you're in a recession, it takes you a long time to actually figure it out. Uh, if, this, if, if, the, if we've seen an increase in the unemployment rate by a quarter point over a three-month period and we're debating it, don't debate. We're, we're in all likelihood we're uh, in an economic downturn. So here's I can go on, uh, but these are the kind of things that we should be watching. The uh, equity market also important, uh, but uh, pretty gives you a pretty good sense of where we're headed. Okay, finally, a uh, part four, uh, the policy response. So you know, logic would dictate um, 
that if we have an economic downturn, a recession, the next one will, will not be, it'll be more garden variety, more typical, not the financial crisis. The financial crisis was a crisis, lots of debate as to, you know, why we got into that mess. But, you know, I think fundamentally the, uh, the reason is that the problems in the economy, the problems in the economy were created in part by what was going on in the financial system, but the problems in the economy also took out the financial system, right? The subprime mortgages that started to uh, go, started to default, the losses were more than the capital that the banking system held, and banks started to fail, investment banks started to fail, and it required a government bailout. Without the bailout, it would have been, you know, meaningfully worse. But uh, once the financial system is infected, you know, it's a whole different ball game. That doesn't feel like that can ha is going to happen this go around, largely because of the policy response after this, cri this past crisis. You know, Dodd Frank being the poster child for those changes. It, most importantly, the the banking system is now much uh, higher capitalized. There's a lot more capital there, much more liquid, much better risk management, stress testing, and a lot of other changes since the financial crisis. So, it doesn't feel like. Uh, uh, the financial system can be taken down uh, this go around. It would it, it'd take a pretty dark scenario to get to that place. It could happen, but it, you know, it's pretty far out on the tail of the, the distribution of possible uh, possible outcomes. Um, also, you don't see some of the imbalances in the economy that you typically see. You know that really create problems. Uh, makes recessions more severe and lengthy. You know, in times past when we were more manufacturing oriented, you'd see lots of uh, inventories. Don't see that. More recently, the problems have been in real estate, housing. You'd see overbuilt housing markets. You don't really see that, except in the high-end apartment market here in D.C. in Philadelphia. But we have an affordable housing crisis. We have a shortage of housing, you know, particularly for uh, low-income, uh, low and moderate-income uh, workforce housing, that kind of thing. So the typical this recession should be more typical. Uh, but I I point out a couple things that make me nervous. First thing is the, I already alluded to, and that's what's going on in the rest of the world. Uh, yeah, Europe uh, is uh, arguably already in recession, and they have no way of responding to it that will, of any meaning, uh, this, uh, of, of any meaning. I mean, the ECB reacted uh, this week by cutting rates, but, you know, it's gone from negative 40 basis points to negative 50 basis points. I mean, really, I mean, how much, uh, uh, support is that going to provide to the economy? Uh, they don't really have much fiscal space. The only country that does, the only room, the country that has any room to use fiscal policy is the Germans, but they're, you know, as you know, pretty reticent to use that fiscal space and do, do, don't appear likely to use it. And if you think we have political problems, their political problems are very serious. I mean, going to every European country, you've got a very uh, large and growing populist movement that's very Euro skeptic, Eurozone skeptic. And you've got Brexit over here, you know, just fomenting those uh, that angst. So it's not hard to get to a, a scenario where Europe goes into a deep recession and we have another existential crisis in Europe. Uh, in my view, the problems in Europe, uh, the European debt crisis is, is not over. It's just, it's coming back. It's just a matter of time. Uh, and that that could be now, you know, as they're getting stressed with, with the weak economy and rising unemployment, that's the fodder for these political problems kind of boiling over. The other uh, reason for some concern about the severity of the recession is here at home, uh, we don't have a lot of room either, particularly with regard to monetary policy. Monetary policy is really important in recessions. Uh, and to give you a sense of that, we, I simulated uh, the, our model of the global economy, assuming that uh, the Federal, Fun Federal Reserve lowers interest rates, the federal funds rate target, consistent with what the bond market, futures markets now are expecting the Fed to do. So futures investors are fully anticipating that the Fed's going to cut interest rates next week and then uh, two or three more times through the end of the year into early next. If they do that, and this gives you a sense of the uh, impact on uh, GDP in the United States, it's important. So uh, by the end of 2020, uh, the uh, level of GDP in the U.S. will be about a half a point higher than it would have been otherwise. That, that kind of, remember I said if the president follows through on all of his, you know, tariff increases, it, uh, you know, likely about a half a point, this is going to be, this will wash out uh, some, of the, some of that effect from the trade war. 
by the end of 2021, it's about a percentage point. So it's not inconsequential. So we need the Fed to uh, respond to the weakening economy. However, the, the concern is that uh, they're going to run out of room, uh, that you know, uh, we're at a 2% funds rate target. In a typical economic downturn, the Federal Reserve lowers the funds rate by five percentage points. Five percentage points. We're at two. They, you know, they, they, they go five. That's typical. That's a typical recession. So it's very likely if we get into a recession, we're going to go to the we're going to go to zero very fast as the zero lower bound. Fed will uh, restart quantitative easing, buying long-term bonds, and it's very very likely that we will have negative interest rates here in the United States. So if we go in recession here, we will in all likelihood uh, have a situation that's very similar to what's going on in Europe and Japan will be uh, negative rates, which is you know we're very upside down world and you know uh, very kind of a scary world. So uh, we do need fiscal policy to step up uh, in this environment. And uh, you know, historically, that has happened. This shows uh, uh, fiscal uh, st stimulus uh, con uh, restraint. Not, non uh, this is the discretionary part of uh, the fiscal, po fiscal policy. Uh, this abstracts from the uh, so-called automatic stabilizers that are in the budget and the tax code that just kind of kick in as a matter of course, as part of law uh, in the system, you know, UI uh, insurance rises and other income support programs, uh, we spend more on that. And uh, the tax code is somewhat uh, progressive, and so uh, that helps to cushion the blow a little bit. This is discretionary policy, and you can see that it can be uh, uh, quite significant. So if you go back to 2009, that was the Recovery Act, and that this shows uh, that the Recovery Act added about two and a half percentage points to GDP in 2009. Just, just uh, for context, GDP declined by three and a half percentage points in 2009. So without the stimulus, uh, the economy would have contracted six percentage points. Instead of the unemployment rate peaking at 10 percent, which is what it peaked at in the, the financial crisis, so it peaked at somewhere around 13 or 14 percent, to give you a sense of magnitude. So uh, we do need fiscal policy kick in. We haven't, we're having a little bit of stimulus now. You can see in 2018, 19, uh, some of the stimulus was coming from the tax cut. Uh, that's deficit finance tax cuts. Uh, uh, now we're starting to get more government spending. You may re remember about a month ago, we got a budget bill that passed that increased government spending. So we'll get a little bit of juice in, in 2020, but uh, really a uh, small order of magnitude. I'll say a couple things and I'll stop. Uh, first thing I'd say is if, if the economy is weakening and we go into recession, uh, I, I, I don't think we should be fixated on government budget deficits and debt at that point. Uh, I think government deficits and debt are a big deal. Uh, I think it's a mistake that we have not addressed them in the last couple, three years when the economy has been performing well. This was the time to make progress in reducing deficits and debt. But once you go into recession, particularly in a world of low interest rates, uh, I think uh, it's much more important to focus on getting the economy back on the rails, and uh, we should not be focused on uh, deficits and debt in that period of time. The final thing I'd say is, um, and this is where I, when I helped on the Recovery Act, it was mostly at a 30,000 foot level, giving policymakers a sense of the uh, benefit of different aspects of fiscal stimulus, including state and local government aid and giving them estimates of so-called bang for the buck, multipliers. You know, how important are these things? How much juice will they provide to the economy? And at the very, not at the very top of the list of uh, multipliers, bang for the buck, was uh, state and local fiscal aid. Just to give you a sense of the magnitude, back in 2009, the multiplier, meaning the increase in GDP for a given dollar uh, of, uh, uh, of support, either uh, in the case of state and local government aid, more aid to state and local governments or, or a payroll tax cut, you know, reduction in payroll taxes by dollar. The multiplier for state and local governments was 1.7, uh, 1.7. The For context, the highest was uh, SNAP, was the uh, food stamps, which was well over two. Uh, and among the lowest were uh, tax cuts for businesses. The multipliers were about a half a point, maybe even less than a half a point. Those multipliers are not immutable. They are a function of the economic environment. Uh, you know, because interest rates are low and likely to go lower, uh, you get 
you get more juice. If you're in a full employment economy, those multipliers will be smaller. But uh, you know, in a recession, I think aid to uh, helping state and local governments uh, through that next recession will be critically important to the policy response. If we don't, if state and local governments don't get that support. Uh, again, in the context of low interest rates, uh, the recession will be much more severe. And instead of a more typical economic downturn, we'll have a much more severe one. Okay, I covered a lot of ground. I took my, I think I took my 40 minutes, and I'll turn it back to the group and um, see what you want to chat about. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, oh, yeah, um, yeah, actually, we were doing it with um, oh, the... Uh, oh, we have cards? Oh, I'm sorry. So, yeah, oh, I sorry. didn't realize. Actually, if you want to join oh, us. Oh, yeah, I'll, sure. We can sit down. And we'll see what the... Okay. Yeah, actually, so someone pointed out that... Sorry, and I didn't realize we had a process, but... Okay. Well, we did have... Yeah, so um, perhaps lots of people were having breakfast when we explained we're doing questions through note cards. So if you um, have questions, there should be no cards in your packet, and raise them up, and our team will come get them and hand them in. So, um, okay. So one of the questions is, and I I know you said we shouldn't say this time will be different, but is there any way that we could actually avoid a recession? Yeah, I I think uh, it's up to the president. Um, I think if the president found a way to stand down on the trade war um, relatively soon, uh, I think we'd likely navigate through without an economic downturn. Um, and in fact, uh, that's my baseline economic outlook. I mean, if I had to pick a scenario that I felt most likely, even, even given my first chart, I'd say the president's going to figure this out, and if he hasn't already, he kind of senses it already in the, in the last few days. He's trying to figure out ways to kind of stand down, come to kind of some kind of arrangement with the Chinese. Mm -hmm. And I would fully anticipate that because, it's, you know, on top of the economic consequences, there's you know, obviously very significant political consequences. So I would expect him to find a way to come to terms with the Chinese. Not that those terms will be substantive. You know, I don't think we're going to get anything uh, substantive out of uh, this arrangement. Uh, I don't think the Chinese are going to play any fairer after all of this. Uh, but I do think it's likely that he'll figure out a way to um, you know, reduce tensions, and this gets off the front pages by the end of the year. I'd be, I'm still, I'd be surprised if he actually followed through on those tariffs. Now, having said all of that, you know, I'm. I'm not sure we can say anything with any high level of confidence about the president and how he's going to behave uh, and what he's going to do or how he's thinking about things, thus the risks, mm -hmm. thus the risks. Mm -hmm. so, so uncertainty is not helpful. No, and that goes to the business confidence, right? I mean, businesses are, that's why they're so nervous, because they can't figure him out either, right? And he can change things with a tweet. I mean, did that a month ago. You changed things with a tweet. So, you know, if you're a business person and you have to make a, a big investment decision or expansion decision, you're just not going to do it, right? Because is it a 15% tariff? Is it a 30% tariff? It, which products is it on? I mean, just to, just the last couple of days, you know, uh, what is being levied, what what products are facing tariffs has changed. Which countries? You know, how long is it going to be in place? You know, all these things. Matter. And then, you know, it, things like, for example, you've seen uh, American companies divert economic activity from China to other uh, parts of the world as the president wanted, although he wanted to come back here in the United States, and there's no chance of that happening. But it, a lot of it went into Vietnam, for example. Mm -hmm. And now the trade deficit with Vietnam is starting to widen out. The president starts tweeting about Vietnam. <laughs> so can you imagine you're a business person listening to that? So, uh, you know, it's those kinds of things that drive I'm speaking as a business person, right? I'm an economist, but I run a business, right? I have 250 people who work for me all across the globe, and it's a business. Mm -hmm. And as a business person, I, if I can't, I'll give you a trade secret. And this is something uh, CFOs do and economists do. They open up Excel, 
Uh, and then they <laughs> plug in numbers in Excel, and at the bottom it says return on investment or impact on the economy. If you can't fill in every cell, you can't get the return on investment. If you can't get the return on investment, you don't make the investment. It's not like you cut. You're not going to do that. But it means you're not going to make a big investment decision. And so, uh, yeah, the uncertainty is quite significant. And that's why even if the president you know, stands down and finds a, a, a way to uh, uh, reduce tensions but does not reduce the tariffs or eliminate the tariffs, they're still out there. And it's still going to make business people nervous. So the economy is not going to get its groove back. I'm not arguing that. But we could avoid, avoid an economic downturn. Um, so given that we are talking about the possibility of recession, um, one of the questions is that recession responses understandably focus on federal policy. But are there options that states have in responding to a recession? Well, I think the most important thing states can do is to prepare for recessions. Uh, that, uh, and I think states actually, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they, they learn from the experience of 10 years ago, and many are building up their uh, rain, so-called rainy day funds. So they have a cushion. Uh, and I think if it's a typical, if we, if we do suffer a kind of a typical economic downturn, I think most states have enough financial wherewithal to kind of maintain spending roughly where it is to get through uh, and not have to pull back. Um, so that, that's the best thing to do, to be you know, thinking about this before you actually have a downturn and prepare for it. You know, you know, one of the things that we've been doing with states is helping them with their own stress testing, like bank stress tests, meaning you assume a recession and then you see what it happens to your bank, you know, to your lending, to your uh, deposits, uh, to your profitability, to your capital. Uh, I think states should be doing that as well, you know, stress testing their revenue streams and their spending what happens in an economic downturn, and what kind of cushion, what kind of rainy day fund do I need uh, to be prepared for that? Now, can you be prepared for you know, financial crisis? No, because if that happens, you know, you're going to need help. There's not much you can do about that. The winds are blowing too hard. Mm -hmm. But if it's typical, uh, you should be prepared for that, right? And the state should be prepared for that. So in that case, what is a, can you define a typical recession? Yeah, so a typical recession is, uh, uh, the best statistic that most people can get their minds around is an increase in unemployment. So if the un in a typical recession, the unemployment rate rises three percentage points, right? So we're at a 3.7% unemployment rate, you know, just around four. A typical recession would put the peak unemployment rate around seven, around seven, mm -hmm. but, you know, which is, um, doesn't sound high, uh, particularly after you've suffered 10, <laughs> but uh, that represents a lot of pain and suffering for a lot of people. But does it translate into like a, a one-year downturn in uh, revenues or, you know, like what? Yeah. Like if you're planning with rainy day funds and yeah. you're looking ahead, like what are you? Yeah. I, I think the size of the rainy day fund depends on the state, right? Because it depends on the revenue base and, you know, some states have, a, and this is why it's important to stress test, as you know, some states have revenue bases that are much more cyclical than other states. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, you know, states like uh, like a California or a Massachusetts, because you know, they generate a lot of income revenue from you know capital gains and the progressivity of their income tax system. So when times are good like now, they're raking in a lot of money, but when times are tough, they get creamed. Right, so they need a much larger rainy day fund than a state where where you have a much more stable employment base. I mean, every state's going to suffer in a recession by definition. But you know they, so it really does depend on the state that you're in. And, and when I say 3% increase in unemployment rate, that's nationwide. That means some states are going to have an increase of five, six percentage points, some states one or two. So you, know, you have to take that into consideration as well. Um, so I think uh, we have a couple of questions on the, uh, the same idea. And I think this is what we also heard in talking about the stimulus packages, that one of the goals was that um, state when states cut back on their spending in a recession, that it can actually have these uh, negative effects. And you touched on that a little bit in your uh, presentation, but can you sort of talk about how, uh, like, like how you how you describe that while you were talking to folks about the stimulus packages, and also how you can inform federal and state policymakers who may not have been through a recession why this is 
uh, uh, challenging when you do when states do that. Well, I mean, I think it's obvious, but I think it's uh, important to remind people that you know the support, the funds coming in are, are fungible, right? I mean, if I if I have to spend more on uh, you know uh, 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 Medicaid or if I have less revenue, then that's going to affect all my spending and, and my support to the state economy. So if I can, as a federal, at the federal level, provide support, best one of the best mechanisms is through the Medicaid program or through education spending, then that uh, frees up resources that I can use elsewhere to kind of maintain my uh, broader spending and support to the, to the state's economy. And uh, it's, uh, the other point is that uh, the, uh, what the, the state and local governments spend is one for one with economic activity, right? I mean, it goes directly, it's like a direct injection into the economy. It's not like a tax cut where, you know, some of the tax cut goes to higher income households who save that money. So the impact of that on the broader economy, at least uh, for a while, is, is uh, mitigated by the fact that, that you have all this so-called leakage, you know, the savings and everything else. With, government, with state government spending, that is, that, that's a direct injection into the economy. So if, I'm, if I spend a dollar more, if I spend a dollar less, that has a you know, one for one impact on what's going on in the economy. And that, that affects uh, everything more broadly. So if I, you know, uh, if I if as a state government pull back on my spending and there's fewer jobs and those people have less income, they spend less, that creates you know, uh, problems elsewhere in the economy and it can be quite significant. So the, that's why the multipliers, the bang for the bucks are so, is so high for things like state and local government outlays. It's why it's an, you know, kind of a very important, straightforward, uh, nothing is easy, but relatively easy you know, way of helping to support an economy in, in, uh, in a difficult time. Um, so uh, we're coming close to time. I just don't know if you have like one recommendation for uh, the federal and state policymakers as they think about preparing for the recession and the intersection of the two levels of the government. Well, I think they should listen to you and all your work. I mean, uh, you're, this is really okay. important because uh, you know recessions don't come along very often. You know, here I'll say, I'll say one final thing. This is why it's so important that you have events like this and have this kind of conversation. Um, this is a bit of economic astrology. Uh, there's been recessions at the start of every decade since World War II. 1950, 1960, 1970, 19, with one exception, 1980, 1990, 2000. The exception is uh, the last recession was, it should have been 2010. It was 2008. I blame that on policymakers. They messed up. It should have been 2010, but it was 2008. <laughs> In 20, now I'm arguing. 2020. By the way, the date is June 20th, 2020. Just write that down. <laughs> uh, and you may ask, well, why is that the case? You know, why does that happen? And many reasons, but one of the key reasons, I think, is that it takes about 10 years for people to forget that the previous leaders, you know, CEOs of companies, uh, Congress people, uh, you know, people that work uh, in uh, think tanks like Pew, they, they, they leave, they turn over. And the people that take over, the younger people that take over, naturally think, you know, those guys were idiots. Uh, you know, I'm smarter, I know this better. In my world, I got better data. I got AI and machine learning. What did you have? Uh, and so they think they, you know, know better and they forget. And so it's very important to uh, have this kind of discussion to remember uh, and to think back, uh, uh, because it, you know it, this time is not different, uh, uh, and uh, you know we will experience a recession, and it's important to be prepared for it. So, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.